so we, we all have care stories in our families. I, I know that a lot of people, when they hear about the walk-care fund, they think of it, oh, it's a tax, right? Or something like that. It, and certainly that's part of it, right? There's a premium that people pay in. But really what this is, is a, a, an attempt uh, to um, ease the burden on families um, uh, and on employers when someone uh, has a loved one who needs long-term care. And we all have this in their families. Here we see the story of, um, the story of Mari and Robert. Um, uh, Mari doesn't wanna be a burden on her adult children. They have their own kids to care for. She's having trouble getting in and out of the tub and is afraid of falling. Robert's mother is in her 80s and keeps falling at home. Now she's broken her arm. She lives alone and there's no uh, family in town to help. Um, these are common scenarios. We all have them in our lives. I know my mom had Parkinson's for 15 years. It was a long journey. Um, and it's, you know, it's when someone in, in a family has a long-term care need, it affects everyone. It's, it's a crisis that affects their children, you know, their spouse, their brothers and sisters. Um, everyone pitches in to try to help the family cope. And the need for long-term care can come unexpectedly, it can come earlier in life. Uh, many people have illnesses or accidents or are born with a disability and, and need long-term care. Um, Walk Cures Fund would only cover people who pay in. It's an earned benefit, but uh, in our state, uh, a, a large share of people uh, with disabilities are in the workforce and uh, would be paying in and benefiting from this as well. And also it's important to remember, like many of us, I have a friend, a colleague actually, who uh, was uh, had a skiing accident when he was in his early 20s and was in a wheelchair the rest has been in a wheelchair ever since and um, you know you can have an accident or or illness of some kind and need long-term care during your career as well and when a need for long-term care strikes it can overwhelm uh, a family's finances uh, Carlos turned 50 last year and after caring for his mom, he realized he needs long-term care insurance, but can't afford it. It would cost him $2,700 a year. That is the average premium nationwide for, for long-term care insurance. Um, if you already have life insurance, um, uh, which is can be like a universal life insurance or so not term, but universal or whole life insurance, you can sometimes add a chronic illness waiver or something like that to it. It would cost less than that, but if you don't have a life insurance policy already in place, an expensive life insurance policy already in place, it's very expensive to get a standalone long-term care policy. Lillian has been struggling uh, to live on her own since her stroke and her family doesn't live nearby. Um, she was surprised to learn that Medicare doesn't cover long-term care. And to qualify for Medicaid, she'd have to spend down her entire life savings to $2,000. She's worried about losing that savings and having to rely on her children for financial support. So, you know, this is this is why Walk Cares was enacted. It, long term care is kind of a gap in our system. Health insurance doesn't cover it. Medicare doesn't cover it. To get access to Medicaid, you need to deplete your life savings, uh, and that's no one's vision of retirement. And long term care insurance is very expensive. Only about seven percent of Americans can afford it. Um, afford it means not just afford it one year, but be able to, you have to pay it in, say if you're 40 years old, you have to be able to afford to pay premiums for 40 or 50 years because with private long-term care insurance, you have to pay until the day you die or need care. Uh, if you drop the coverage when you're 85 and you need care when you're 87, uh, then you don't get it. So it's only useful if you pay it until the day you die or need care. And many people on a fixed in income cannot afford to pay private long-term care insurance premiums in retirement. Um, so what is long-term care? It's help with things like bathing, eating, dressing, taking medication. Um, it's, it's what most of us need. Seven in 10 of us are going to need it as we get older. Um, you know, my dad, uh, lives alone in the woods. He drinks more than he should. And he, he falls down the stairs once in a while. And, um, and, and, and he, that happened to him once and, um, and he needed care. And, um, that's one way it can happen. You know, my mom had Parkinson's. Um, I have another family member who has uh, just has uh, Alzheimer's. There's a lot, you know, as I mentioned, there's also other ways if you have an illness or accident. There's a lot of different ways people end up needing this. It costs about $33,000 a year for 20 hours of home care, 20 hours of home care per week, um, which is where kind of where most people start their care trajectory. Um, to give you a sense of how this works for most people, of all the people who need 
uh, long-term care. About a third of the people need it for a year or less, so close to the end of their lives. Uh, another third need it for one to three years, and uh, another third need it for um, more than three years. Um, Walk Here is, is designed, uh, it has a benefit of $36,500. It's designed to be an affordable premium for a modest but important benefit. It's not meant to solve the entire problem that families face here. But for about a third of people, it would cover all their costs. For that middle third, it would cover a significant chunk of their costs. And if they're able to budget well or get family members to help it, uh, you know, with unpaid care, maybe they can help it. Uh, maybe they can get through their entire care trajectory without ever having to apply for Medicaid or deplete their life savings. Um, and then for the final third who need it for more than three years, um, you know, walk cares will help get them started, but ultimately they probably end up having to apply for Medicaid. Long-term care is not medical care, um, not covered by health insurance or Medicare, um, and it's unaffordable for most of us. So the median household income in Washington state for seniors is $56,000. So that means that half of senior households in our state have less than $56,000 in income, half have more. If it costs you know, $33,000 for a year of, of long-term care, it's clear that most families can't afford to pay for that out of pocket. Half have no 401k or pension income as well. So um, this is just something that most families can't deal with. Uh, and Walk Cares uh, gives them some relief. Um, so uh, we have about 860,000 family caregivers in our state, uh, about 11% of our population. They spend a total of 720 million hours a year caring for family members. One, one caregiver, uh, family caregiver that we'd like to, to, to focus on is Christina. She's uh, at 44 years old, Christina Keys was in the prime of her career at a successful technology company. Then her 62-year-old mother suffered a stroke and Christina set aside her plans, career, and salary to become her mother's full-time caregiver. Christina learned that her mother's Medicare and supplemental health insurance didn't cover her, uh, the long-term services that her mother needed for daily living. She began to pay for her mother's care out of pocket and then out of both of their retirement savings, all while foregoing her salary. For Christina, the Walk Cares benefit would have covered about a year of services for her mom and given Christina time to plan for her mother's care. Her family could have used the benefit to hire a professional caregiver uh, or compensate Christina for the time she spent um, caring for her mom and unable to work. So we, we often forget that family caregiving isn't free. The, the way that we deal with this problem today in families is that loved ones, mostly women, um, take time out of the workforce uh, to care for those loved the family members who need care. Um, almost half of family caregivers report a related financial setback. 25%, uh, they spend, on average, family caregivers spent 25% of their own income on expenses for their loved one. The average lost wages and benefits for, a care, for caregivers 50 and older who leave the workforce early to care for an older loved one is $303,000. And the reason for that is that if you take an example, like of my mom, she had Parkinson's. Her husband was 60 years old when she got the diagnosis. And um, he, was in the, he was still working and, and making more money than he ever had. Um, he was a low income individual and he had to take, he had to quit his job. He decided to quit his job because my, to allow my mom to stay in, at home and not have to go to a facility. And so he cared for her for five years until she passed away giving up five years of income. And then when he went, tried to get back in the, in the workforce, um, they wouldn't hire him back. They told him he was too old. The work that he did was physically demanding and he couldn't get his job back. And so he lost not only five years of income, but also five years of 401k contributions, five years of employer match on those contributions. And, you know, social security benefits are uh, based on uh, your 35 highest earning years, the average of your 35 highest earning years. He lost five earnings years. So he had five zeros in his, Social Security benefit formula, which really lowered his Social Security. So that's why it can really add up. Um, you know, if your Social Security benefits are lower throughout your retirement, you can't save as much and you, learn, you lose a lot of earnings, it has a significant effect on people. Two and three working caregivers say a program that pays caregivers would help them. And that's one thing that Walk Cares does. So, you know, this also impacts the labor force and ability of workers. Of, of, of particularly women to, 
to stay in the labor force. Job openings in Washington grew from 165,000 in 2020 to 224,000 in 2021. Well, the number of workers stagnated. I don't need to tell you this. I'm sure that you're all very much acutely aware of the shortage of workers today. And you know, part of the one of the causes of this has been lack of childcare during the pandemic, of course. But another cause is that as our society ages, um, many women are are in the position where they have to stay home in order to care for someone. Sixty-one percent of working caregivers has have reported um, that has impacted their job performance. 53% say they went in late, left early, or took time off to provide care. You also get this phenomenon known as presentism, where people show up to work, but they're exhausted and aren't able to focus and aren't as productive as they would otherwise be. 15% went from full-time work to part-time or reduced hours, and 25% report that their own health has worsened since taking on the family caregiving role while, while balancing that with work. So, if we look at this at a macro level, this phenomenon that's hitting families and family caregivers also affects the state. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that even if walk cares had never been enacted, the state would have had to um, increase uh, sales tax revenues, for example, to pay for the age wave. So the blue line here is the population 85 or older. It is doubling in 15 years uh, from 2020 to 2035. And so uh, and at the same time, the, the, the population of, of people in prime caregiving age from 40 to 64 is declining or stagnating. So the rate it used to be in 2010 that we had seven people 45 to 64 uh, for every person who was 85 or older. And in 2050, we're going to have three people 45 to 64 for every person who's 85 or older. And that means that there just won't be enough people of prime caregiving age to care for all of us when we're older. And um, that's going to, and as the, the, the number of people 85 and older doubles, more and more people are going to end up going on Medicaid, which is going to force uh, an increase in sales taxes uh, or would have without walk cares. So in the last biennium, the state spent $6.4 billion on long-term care, mostly through Medicaid. It was about 6.3% of the state budget. Um, with a doubling of the population likely to need care, we could have ended up seeing this 12% of our budget going to long-term care uh, in 15 years. Clearly, that's not possible. It's not sustainable. It would it would wreck our tax system. And this is another reason why Walk Cares was enacted, so that rather than waiting until there's a crisis, uh, planning ahead, having workers pay in into a fund uh, to pre-fund long-term care so that all these costs don't hit at once uh, 15 uh, years from now. The Walk Cares Fund uh, helps in a number of ways. Uh, let's, let me just summarize how it works. It's a, it works like Medicare hospital insurance. It's a universal long-term care program. It's an earned benefit. Only those who pay in are eligible. Self-funded from worker contributions. So it relieves pressure on the state budget, um, uh, but also you know, it cannot run a deficit. It can only pay out what, what it takes in. You only pay in while you're working. Uh, if you take time off to care for a loved one to raise a child, uh, or once you're retired, you stop paying in. This is one of the main reasons why Walk Cares is affordable um, for workers compared to much more affordable than private long-term care insurance because you only pay in while you're working and while you're working, you only owe about a half a percent of your wages. Whereas for private insurance, it's a risk-based premium based on your health status and your parents' health status and your parents' health history, your entire health history of your family. And um 30% of people don't even qualify for the underwrite, don't even meet the underwriting criteria. Um, but then if you do qualify, it's based on a number of health factors. And on average, the premium is $2,700 a year. Granted, that's for much more generous coverage than walk cares, but uh, you know, walk cares type coverage isn't even available on the private market. Um, so for most people, the premium is significantly higher, particularly the lifetime premium, because the, the annual premium isn't the relevant cost. What matters is what you pay over your lifetime. For walk years, if you're 45 years old today, you'll owe tw about 20 years of premiums if you retire at 65. And let's say the, the average premium for the typical worker, the median premium is about $300 a year. So if you pay, that's just for somebody who makes about 50 grand. So if you pay 20 years, uh, and you're the median worker makes you make 50 grand, you'll pay $300 times 20. So um, that's $6,000. And you'll have access to a $36,500 benefit. Even if you make four times that, 
Um, even if you make $200,000, if you're 45 today, you pay in 20 years, you're still paying in less than the, than the benefit here. And this benefit goes up with inflation. Even after you stop working, it keeps going up with inflation. Um, everyone is covered at the same rate regardless of pre-existing conditions. That's really important because in private insurance, uh, as I mentioned, about 30% of people wouldn't even qualify for coverage. And women pay up to 50% more than men for the same coverage because women live longer and because it's a risk-based premium, private insurers have to take that into account. Um, walk, because of walk cares, it reduces the need to raise taxes to pay for Medicaid long-term care. Um, uh, and it's a more efficient and effective way to pay for this because people pay when they can afford to, rather than having all the costs hit them when they're 85 years old. And um, you know, at that point, you're not working. You know, when my dad fell down the stairs, he's 83 years old. Uh, he's retired. He's on a fixed income. He has. He doesn't have the ability to pay for that. Uh, with Watt Cares, you know, if he'd had Watt Cares long ago, he would have been paying in a little bit out of every paycheck, kind of like with Medicare hospital insurance. So that when he needed the care, the money was there for him. Benefit is flexible. You can use it on any kind of long-term care, whether it's a home care aide, a facility. Uh, a loved one could become a paid caregiver, which is a really important feature if you want to keep the money in your household meal delivery, uh, transportation to see a doctor, et cetera. Um, the premium is 0.58% of wages, about a half a percent of wages, goes into a trust fund that can only be used for this purpose. Uh, federal employees are excluded. Uh, employees of a tribe are not automatically included. They have to, uh, the tribe has to opt in. Self-employed individuals can opt in if they so choose. Certain workers uh, can apply for an exemption. Um, you know, people who had private insurance prior to November of last year, they had the chance to get an exemption based on that. That is no, that has uh, passed, but that was uh, possible in the past, grandfathering in private coverage. Going forward, due to legislative changes, and also in response to what we heard from um, your Chamber of Commerce and other Chambers of Commerce, as well as legislators, we've um, given people who work in border states but commute to work in Washington now the right to apply for an exemption. So they no longer would have to pay in if they if they you know if they know they're not going to retire in Washington State, um, they may want to uh, opt out. Um, although I would say that the legislature it did ask our oversight body, the LTS Trust Commission, to work on options for making the benefit portable. So there's a chance that going at some point in the future that you would be able to retire uh, in another state and or you live in another state and get the benefit. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, temporary workers on a non-immigrant visa, like farm workers or certain tech workers, uh, can apply for an exemption, as can spouses of active duty military because they move around every few years and would have trouble using the benefit. And veterans with a service-connected disability rating of 70% or greater uh, because they have access to long-term care through the VA uh, can also uh, apply for an exemption. This, this chart, these charts give a sense of what the premiums are over a career. So for the, the, the middle column is the typical earner, um, median earner, um, earns $50,000 over 30 years, they would pay in $8,700. Um, if, if you make more, you pay in a little bit more. If you pay in less, you pay in less. It's proportional to what you earn, obviously. In, in, in all cases, you know, it's significantly less. Um, like for the typical, let's say you get a, a private insurance policy for $2,000 a year and, um, and you're 40 years old, um, you're probably gonna have to pay into that for 45 or 50 years, um, you know, till you're 85 or 90. Um, and that's probably, you know, over $100,000 of lifetime premiums. Now, granted, that's for more generous coverage, but it's it's a lot more in premiums. This is about 8000 you know, $9,000 in premium for the typical worker. Um, uh, to be fair, you know, again, to talk more about this, to be fair, of course, you know, that private coverage offers much more generous benefits, more than 30, instead of 36.5, those policies might have 150 or $200,000 of coverage. But you should, but one of the reasons for walk cares is that, you know, for private insurance companies, it's not profitable for them to sell a modest policy that only pays out 36.5 because um, they, they don't have the scale. The scale doesn't justify the costs uh, to administer those policies, doing assessments and underwriting and claims adjusting and all of that. Um, we don't have any underwriting with walk care, so we don't have those expenses. And we can afford, when you do it for everyone in the whole state and you group everyone in the whole state, our administrative costs are a lot lower. And we can, you know, we, you can 
have an affordable premium for, for, a, for a modest benefit that everyone can have access to. The, a private, the private insurance product is never going to be a product for the broad middle class. It never has been. For 40 years, the industry has been doing its best to try to, to expand beyond that 7% of people that they cover currently. It's never been able to happen because it's just not affordable uh, uh, for, for the middle class, for the broad middle class. Upper middle class people, sure. Um, but for the broad middle class, it's just $100,000 in lifetime premiums just isn't affordable. Um, so the way there's three ways you can qualify for coverage. One is if you have an illness or accident during your career and you've paid in three out of the last six years, you'd be eligible for benefits. Um, if you, for most people, they qualify for this middle column. You pay in 10 years over your career. That's the way Medicare hospital insurance works. You pay in 10 years or social security works the same way. Pay in 10 years over the course of your career and you, you have a permanent access to your benefit. This, this legislative session, a new pathway was created for near retirees. Um, if you're born before 1968, um, you know, so most, if you're 55 or older, uh, basically, um, you can earn 10% of the full benefit for every year you pay in. So this was a, the legislature's attempt to make sure that everyone, that near retirees would also have access to benefits in proportion to what they pay in. Uh, so workers contribute to what walk cares, employers do not. Um, employers who collected premiums, uh, you know, based on the previously, there was a start date in January of this year, and um, those employers who collected those premiums were able to get refunded. Um, the new start date is July 1st of 2023, um, next summer, and the employers begin quarterly reporting to the Employment Security Department in October of 2023. Um, exemptions are processed by the Employment Security Department, not by employers. January 1st, 2023 is the, the date when exemption applications will be begin to be accepted by the Employment Security Department. And um, employers collect premiums from all workers except those who have provided confirmation from ESD that they're exempt. So the state tried to make this easy or straightforward to administer. Uh, so basically an employer will collect premiums from everyone except the workers for whom they have an exemption on file. And it's up to the worker to provide that exemption to the employer. So the employer doesn't have any duty to seek out those exemptions or ask the employment security department. The employee uh, needs to provide that to their employer. And if the employer has it on file for the employee, then, they, then that worker is not uh, participating in the program. This is a cross agency effort. DHS, where I work is the lead agency we process applications and administer benefits. The Employment Security Department collects the premiums and processes exemptions. And the healthcare authority is gonna pay the, the providers, the home care agencies, and also the uh, family members who can get paid to provide care under this program. And the state actuary monitors our finances. Overall, um, uh, I feel that this is a smarter, more affordable way to support middle-class families with long-term care. Um, the old way before what cares is that long-term care insurance was unaffordable for about 90% of, of individuals. Most of us were afraid of not being able to stay in our home as we age. There was, I had anxiety around, you know, what would it mean to my wife and my kids if um, I need long-term care when I'm older? Is that going to cause my wife to quit her job, my son to have to move to be near me and, and hurt his career? Um, and people worry about depleting their life savings and ultimately having to go on Medicaid which is no one's you know, plan for old age. Um, and yet today, many people do end up having to do that. The new way with WAC cares is that long-term care, for the first time in the history of this country, affordable long-term care insurance is, av is available for everyone. Um, peace of, there's peace of mind. You know, all, this, all programs like this, like Medicare or Social Security, are designed to give workers peace of mind during their career that when they're older, um, that this problem that they would have had to deal with will be a little bit easier to deal with because $36,000 will be available as a budget uh, to their family to help deal with the need when it arises. And it allows families to focus on care and not money when care needs arise. Um, you know, a lot of times I know in my family, when someone needed care, uh, of course we were worried about the individual, but the, the top of mind concern was how do we scrape together money when my mom's in Florida and I'm here? How do my brother and sister and I scrape together money to help get her help? And we all had to scramble really quickly. With walk cares, you've got you know at least a year of money there to help the individual get through that while the family can plan. And then it gives flexibility to families. So 
some families may want to have a professional come in, a home care aide. Other families may want to do it themselves, uh, but then choose to be paid as a family caregiver just to help the family pay its bills during a difficult time. Um, the program gives you all of those options. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. All right, great. Thank you, Ben, for sharing all of that information. I do have a few questions that were uh, in the Q&A. And one of those was, for those that have already gone through the opt-out attestation process and received a confirmation letter from the state confirming they can opt out, will those original attestations remain in place or will they need to reattest in order to opt out given the delay in the program start? Great question. So under current law, um, they do not need to reattest. Um, uh, you know, the law could change in the future. I can't, you know, speak for future legislator, legis legislatures, but under current law, there's no need to be a test. Okay, um, there's a few more. So somebody was asking if the 36,500 is, if it's still limited to $100 day withdrawal, or if there will be a future option for lump sum or monthly payments. Great question. So the, in the original, in, in early versions of the legislation, there was a hundred dollar a day uh, cap on how much benefit, how many, much care you could get. That was removed before final passage. So there is no hundred dollar a day cap. So um, I know there was some some I, I, that's just not true, not true. Um, and so for that means that you can uh, when you access the way the program works, if you are a beneficiary, you find you find a home care agency and we help you find one if you would like help. Um, they come and provide care to you and then they bill the state directly. We do it this way. So first of all, to avoid fraud, we don't pay out cash to individuals uh, because that would create an incentive for fraud. Um, and secondly, a lot of people who are going to be beneficiaries might have dementia. And so we want to make it easy on them so that they don't have to deal with the financial side of this. So we put we asked the providers to deal with the paperwork, not the not the beneficiary. So the provider provides the care, they bill us, we pay them. And you could get uh, $50 of care in a day or you could get $200 of care or or $2000 of care in a day, you know, hopefully it's not 2000, but um, whatever you need, um, you can use the benefit however you see fit. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So another one, employees who opted out prior to the, to, to the delay and were approved, will they have to provide proof of long-term care coverage when the premium assessment starts or sometime in the future? So under current law, no, but uh, that could change. Um, that's something the legislature I know has it been bantering, uh, uh, considering. Um, so if I, I would say to be on the safe side, uh, if you want to stay opted out, I would keep your insurance um, uh, because it could be that at some point in the future, um, it's the, the legislature decides to require that you either show that you have coverage or um, or you'd be in the in the water cares program. Um, that said, you know a lot of the original problems with the program have been improved and are continuing to be improved. For example, you know near retirees can now benefit. Uh, it's actually a great deal for new retirees. Um, they're looking at portability, how to make benefits portable if you retire elsewhere. So, you know, I think that for most people, they'd be better off in uh, walk cares, but that's an individual decision, of course. Okay, so since you did discuss portability, it looks like another um, viewer was also wondering if the state will consider allowing those that previously opted out to opt back in. That's another thing that the legislature is looking at. Um, they, uh, because they, you know, a lot of people opted out because they they knew that near retirees weren't eligible and that the benefit wasn't portable and so forth. Now that these things are starting to be fixed, um, I mean, portability has not yet been addressed, but it's something the legislature has asked the, our oversight body, the LTSS Trust Commission, to study. And we're studying it this year. We're going to report back. So they could very well do something about this next year. Um, because the program is being improved in significant ways, they're also they also asked us to to study uh, ways to allow people back in, and so that could be something that happens next year that the legislature says, "Hey, you have until such and such a time 
uh, if you if you want to rescind your exemption to get back in, we'll let you back in. So that's something I think that they're going to be looking at next year as well. Okay, great. Let me see. There's there is quite a few questions in here. So if you don't mind taking a no, please. We have plenty of time. That. We have to. Okay. So let's see. Um, oh, will there be an auditing process? process moving forward for those who have opted out of the state program so the the appointment security department has the the statutory authority to ask for documentation so i mean I, um that's a separate agency from my agency i can't speak for them but they have that authority i don't know if you know how they're planning on using that um uh under current law um you you needed to show that you had coverage prior to november of last year in order to opt out but it could be that in the future that they, the legislature asks people to reattest every few years. I, I, I don't know. So in, in, in general, if you definitely want to stay after that, you should probably keep your private coverage just to be safe, at least yeah. for another year or two. Uh, but, um, you know, I can't advise you, you know, what to do, obviously, but that would be, that's kind of my, my, the best of my knowledge on that. Okay, I have three short more questions, and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So uh, we have, is January 1st, 2023, the final date for exemption? No. Well, so for the private insurance exemptions, uh, you had to have that, you had to have that coverage in place by November of last year. So those, that's a separate matter. But the for the new exemptions for people who commute to Washington from uh, Oregon or Idaho, or people who are, are military spouses and are on non-immigrant visas, these new exemption categories, those you can start applying for January of 2023 and then they'll be permanently available. So in 2070, you can still apply for those because those are ongoing things. Those new exemption categories are for people who wouldn't be able to use the benefit. Like if you're on a non-immigrant visa, you have to go back to your home country after the visa expires. So those people wouldn't even be in the United States. So, um, and for people who are out of state, under current statute, they can't benefit. So that's why they're getting the exemption in perpetuity. So these are new exemption categories that will be permanently available starting in January of next year. Okay. And then I have another individual that went ahead and asked if um, Medicaid would be the only other option. Well, yeah, so it's a great question. So, I mean, Medicaid is an only an option if you if you have less than two thousand dollars in assets and very low income, so Medicaid is is the is the only other public po public option that you have. <clears throat> For most people, they just deplete their life savings, sell their house, uh, kids help them. You know, it's it's a real crisis for families. And then if you get to the point that you have less than two thousand dollars in assets, then you can qualify for Medicaid. All right, and our final question. So. Um... If the state is billed directly from in-home care agencies, how does the beneficiary use the option to pay family members for their services? Great question. So the family member, um, uh, the family member, so the way we this has been set up, um, and this is bigger than just WACARES, it's also in Medicaid long-term care. The, the, the state uh, will, serve as like a fiscal agent for family caregivers who are getting paid. So they'll fill out some paperwork and essentially the state becomes their, their, their employer for purposes of this. They're not the, there's, I don't know the legal terminology, but the way it works is that the, the person getting the care, uh, the loved one getting the care is actually the controlling employer who directs the work of the person, but we, the state would pay that person. So they would get paid just like a home care agency from the state. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your thorough answer on that. And we are happy that you came to share this information with us today. Uh, and we would like to thank you and also thank our sponsors of the Ask the Experts program uh, at STCU for sponsoring and for everybody that joined us today, we would also like to thank you and let you know that we will go ahead and have a recording of this posted to our Facebook soon for you to go ahead and enjoy. And with that, I hope everybody has a great day. I also did go ahead and 
uh, Ben had shared with me the website that you can go to. I've posted that in the in the chat for everyone if you're interested in finding out more information. And with that, Ben, Kevin, and everybody who joined us today, thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much.